It's Oscar week and the controversial film Philomena is nominated for Best Picture. Some critics claim it's anti-Catholic propaganda. My guest tonight says it's riddled with lies. Bill Donahue of the Catholic League is here to discuss. And he's written more than 70 books and sold over 450 million copies worldwide. Author Dean Koontz joins us in an exclusive interview to share the secrets of his art and tell us about his latest work, Innocence. And finally, how safe are the generic drugs you're taking? Where do they come from? And what's the government doing to safeguard the quality of those medicines? Research fellow at the Manhattan Institute and FDA watcher Yevgeny Feynman will tell us. Lots to get to tonight. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Bill Donahue, Dean Koontz, and that blockbuster report on the safety of your generic drugs are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's program, send your tweet to Raymond Arroyo or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN.com. Lots to get to. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. An Al-Qaeda-inspired extremist was sentenced to life without parole Wednesday for hacking a British soldier to death in the streets of London last May. Images of Michael Adebolajo clutching a bloodied knife and a cleaver moments after slaying Lee Rigby shocked the world. It sparked fears of Islamist terror in Britain. Adebolajo's accomplice received a minimum 45-year sentence. Judge Nigel Sweeney said the pair's actions were barbaric, sickening, and pitiless. The judge insisted that Adebolajo had no hope of rehabilitation. Back in the United States, Arizona Governor Jan Brewer has vetoed a bill that had been criticized for being discriminatory against gays and lesbians. The bill is an update of the state's 1999 Religious Freedom Restoration Act it was designed to give businesses the right to refuse to participate in gay marriages and other activities that run afoul of their religious beliefs. Meanwhile, in Texas, a federal judge, Orlando Garcia, struck down that state's gay marriage ban on Wednesday. He said the state law wrongly denies the institution of marriage to gays and lesbians. The judge is not permitting gay marriages in Texas just yet. Rather. He stayed his decision pending appeals. The case is expected to reach the Supreme Court. And two of the church's newly minted cardinals were defending church teaching and the indissolubility of marriage this week before the Vatican Press Corps. The head of the church's doctrinal office, Cardinal Gerhard Müller, insisted that divorce is not a path considered by the church. Continuing, he sharply rebuked those who are advocating a change in church teaching on this matter. He said, we can't insist on it. The doctrine of the church is nothing but the word of Jesus Christ. And the words of Jesus are very clear. I can't change the doctrine of the church. They don't want to understand, end quote. Cardinal Muller added that the real problem of divorce is that the children are no longer with their parents and have to live with others whom they don't know. In a separate press conference, Cardinal Vincent Nichols, Archbishop of Westminster, spoke of possible ways forward for divorced and remarried Catholics, but he warned against simply discarding the first marriage. I think that we, we too easily assume you know, that a breakdown of a first marriage is an irretrievable situation. And I think given some of the things that have been said, about the level of freedom that is needed for a valid marriage. We shouldn't come to that conclusion too quickly. And another step toward reform of the Roman Curia is underway. In a major structural change to the Vatican bureaucracy, the Holy Father this week created a new office to oversee the financial affairs of all Vatican departments. The Secretariat of the Economy, as it is called, is responsible for financial planning, budgeting, and purchasing for the church in Rome. 
In creating the office, Pope Francis wrote that the new body should provide faithful stewardship of Vatican resources, recognizing that they serve the mission to evangelize with particular concern for the most needy. Cardinal George Pell of Sydney was appointed as the Secretariat's first prefect. The assignment means the Cardinal will move to Rome and he will wield significant authority. He'll have to get to work right away as the Vatican also announced this week it expects to run a deficit for 2014. Cardinal Pell is a friend of the world over and we certainly wish him all the best. And Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI is lamenting what he calls absurd speculations about his resignation that have appeared in the Italian media and online recently. His comments came in a letter to La Stampa journalist Andrea Tornielli. The Pope Emeritus wrote, There is absolutely no doubt regarding the validity of my resignation from the Petrine ministry. He said the only condition for its validity was the complete freedom of his decision. He also defended his wearing of the white cassock and keeping the name Benedict, saying he did it for purely practical reasons. At the moment of my resignation, the Pope wrote, there were no other clothes available. Conspiratorial questions about his attire, he said, are another case of completely unfounded speculation. Pope Benedict stepped down from the papacy a year ago this week. Another pope appears on his way to sainthood. This past week, the consulting theologians of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints unanimously recognized a miracle attributed to the intercession of Pope Paul VI. The purported miraculous healing occurred in California in the mid-1990s. An unborn child was found to have serious developmental problems with a high risk of brain damage. Physicians advised that the child be aborted. The mother said no and entrusted her pregnancy to Paul VI. The child was born without problems. He's now an adolescent and remains healthy. The congregation's medical panel had already designated that healing as medically inexplicable. The miracle must now be approved by the prelate members of the congregation and Pope Francis in order for Paul VI to be beatified. And according to an industry report on the world's top wine-drinking countries, the Vatican is the double magnum. The California-based Wine Institute's report says Vatican City consumes 100 bottles of wine per person per year. That's some 25 more bottles a year than the number two nation. Now, a few things would explain this phenomenon. Wine is used at mass, which, of course, occurs countless times a day there. And the official population count of the Vatican is less than 1,000. What is probably also skewing the numbers a bit is the Vatican supermarket which sells tons of vino, tax-free and cheap. And you don't have to be a Vatican citizen to shop there. You just have to be an employee. Maybe Cardinal Pell should add a little non-liturgical wine tax and see if he can close up that deficit. When we return, the film Philomena is nominated for a Best Picture at the Academy Awards. But Bill Donahue says it makes slanderous assertions. And even the Oscar campaigning for the film is a lie. He joins us when the World Over Live continues and Dean Koontz is straight ahead. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. As we approach this week's Academy Awards, one film has been generating some major controversy. Philomena from the Weinstein Company is nominated for four Academy Awards, including Best Picture. It tells the tale of a woman who seeks to find the child she gave up for adoption in the early 1950s. My next guest objects not only to assertions made by the film, but to its characterization of the Sisters of the Sacred Heart, who ran the so-called Magdalene Laundry, so central to the story. Joining us from New York via satellite is the president of the Catholic League, Bill Donahue. Bill, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me, Raymond. Now, Bill, this is about a woman's personal search for her son. It's been nominated for Oscars. It's made $89 million at the box office. Here is what the screenwriter and co-star of the film, Steve Coogan told ABC News. Listen. 
What drove you to this story? I read it in the newspaper four years ago. If you had a child out of wedlock uh, 50 years ago in Ireland, your family would often disown you. And so these uh, mother and baby homes are set up, and you're a young woman who's pregnant, you'd go in there, you'd have your child, the child would be sold uh, to a Catholic, often uh, an American, wealthy American couples. What's wrong with that, Bill? Philomena Lee, in, in real life, went to one of these uh, Magdalene homes, and uh, Mr. Coogan claims she had this experience. Look, her mother died when she was young. The father had six, bo six kids, six, three boys and three girls. He kept the boys, he put the girls in a convent school. In 1952, at the age of 18, Philomena Lee got pregnant out of wedlock. The choice was for her to keep the baby, the street, or the abbey. Well, she couldn't take care of the baby herself. She didn't want to live in the street. There were no atheist homes for her. So the nuns took her in because the father brought her to the nuns and asked them if they would take her in. She signed papers when she was 22, not a teenager. Mm -hmm. She's 22 years of age. She voluntarily signed a consent form giving up custody of her son. She never went to the United States looking for her. Mm. He's always, it's been a lie from the very beginning. She never fit, set foot in the United States until November of 2013 to hawk the movie. But in the movie, it has her going with Coogan, who play, it was basically the guy who's the, the author, Martin Sixsmith, coming looking for this son frantically. Look, the son died of AIDS in, 19, in 1995. She never made any attempt to see the son. She lied to her own daughter, Jane Liberton, never told her own daughter that she actually had a brother because she just kept it a secret until she got loaded at a Christmas party in 2004. And everything I've said is not a matter of dispute. It's indisputable. And I have the facts, and I've annotated it in a, in a uh, lengthy article. It's up on our Internet of Catholic League. Nobody can dispute anything I've said, and they haven't even tried to. But we keep hearing, and every time this story is covered, every time uh, Judy Dench is interviewed or Philomena herself, we keep hearing and reading the child was taken from her by the sisters and essentially sold to the highest bidder. What's wrong with that depiction? Well, you know, it, it has the image of these kidnapping nuns running mm -hmm. down the streets of Ireland in 1952 looking for pregnant girls and fallen women and then bringing them in. What actually happens, I said, the father brought Philomena there at the age of 18, says this kid, she doesn't know what to do with him. They, she voluntarily signs the consent form, giving up custody, and then a couple from the Midwest agrees to adopt the baby. There was no, ch no charge. There was absolutely no fee whatsoever. They decided, as people often do, to give a donation. Now, there is a profound difference between a fee that is charged and a donation. And I think these people like the Weinsteins and Judy Dench and Six Smith and Coogan and the whole rest of this team and all the complicit media, they know the difference. It'd be like saying, well, when a Catholic lights a candle, you have a, a cash box there. You're not required to put a dollar in there to light a candle, but if you would like to make a donation, that's fine. In the book, they actually uh, admit to some of this, but they're selling this as saying they were sold to the highest bidder. It's an out and out lie. Now, what really bothers me is this, Raymond. If you look at the book, Philomena, by Martin Sixsmith, which Coogan plays him in the right. movie, in the prologue, the last paragraph, first sentence, it says, everything in this book is true, comma, or, or, well, why, why the or? As soon as you have an or, it's not everything. Mm -hmm. And the or is that it's re or reconstructed to the best of my ability. Gaps have been filled. Incidents have been surmised. I mean, if they're pressed out on Dan Brown with his pack of lies about the Da Vinci Code, when they're pressed, they say, well, yeah, we, it's true, we fictionalize some things. You fictionalize everything, and everything they did was to paint the nuns as cruel. The nuns were the ones who took her in, the nuns were the ones who got her the job, and the alternative was the street. Why they don't tell the truth is something which I think is the good reason why the Catholic League is in business. Now, the New York Post film critic Kyle Smith, whom I spoke with, he said that this is nothing more than organized hate, a hateful and boring attack on the Catholic Church. Now, Bill, some would say you are being used by Harvey Weinstein in his rally, his attempt to rally Academy voters, and by continually criticizing the film, you're only drawing more attention to his cause. What would you say to that? 
I would say that if this were a, a B movie and it was being shown at the artsy theaters here and there, and it wasn't up for a uh, an Oscar, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I think that uh, that argument might carry some validity. The fact of the matter is, I didn't bring it to the attention of, uh, of the Oscar people. The Weinstein's have an enormous amount of money. This is their eighth anti-Catholic movie. They're well known. He has the personal phone uh, number of the President of the United States and Hillary Clinton. They don't need Bill Donahue to do it. Now, if I didn't say anything about a movie which has been this well hawked by the establishment, I might as well close the doors of the Catholic League. Mm. Am I giving it more attention? Maybe so, but I'm also getting the facts out to people. When we wind up on the front page of, of the Sunday Times in London and in Dublin, just recently, and we, we, and we get these people, uh, their, their back is against the wall, and they're trying to answer these questions now, trying to look at the wiggle room they have, I think we're breaking through. And so I'm, I'm very happy with the tack that we've taken. I'm really wondering, why are the media cooperating and accepting all of these unsubstantiated statements? Mm -hmm. Bill, I had emails this week when people heard you were coming on the show, and they said, now, wait a minute, Philomena met with Pope Francis, and he loved the film. This has been <laughs> widely reported. You'd say what? You know, it was in January of this year that Harvey Weinstein went over to Switzerland to meet with some Vatican officials to try to get them to have the Pope watch the movie. He failed. Mm -hmm. The Pope has never seen the movie. Don't take my word. Father Federico Lombardi of the Holy See right. Press Office has said he doesn't watch these movies. What happened is that a master of ceremonies, not the private secretary to the Pope, a master of ceremonies, one of nine, and another Vatican official did preview it. She didn't get the personal meeting with the Pope. She was part of a general audience. Yeah. I have a picture of them standing behind, uh, uh, beside a wall, reaching over to the Pope. All the Pope did, we have the pictures, we have the audio, the Pope said thanks. That's it. There was no private meeting. So the lies never, never, never stop. Now the latest lie is that she found her son. Her son died in, died in 1995 right in the very grounds of the convent, which, which helped her out. I mean, they just simply lie all the time. And if they, are, if they are so right and I am so wrong, do you think any one of them would have the guts to confront me on TV? Hmm. Before we leave Philomena, now this is Jeff Pope. He is the co-screenwriter, and he's seemingly responding to your criticisms. Listen. And it's not an assault on the Catholic Church at all. You know, absolutely isn't. I think... Um, um, what happens in the, during the course of the, of the story is that Martin comes to respect Philomena's faith. In terms of, of faith, I think it's, it's Martin um, has really is quite awed by the strength of Philomena's faith. I think what the, the target is, and I think this is true of a lot of problems that, that beset the Catholic Church at the moment, is Really, it's about truth and reconciliation rather than trying to hide things and cover them up. And I think this is part of that process. I think it's about being honest about what happened in the, par in the past. Bill, do you accept yeah, that the explanation? Honest, the, the, the honesty uh, uh, about the matter is that uh, they're lying about that as well. You know, every time I, I confront a piece of artwork or sculpture or it's a movie, every time we're insulted, I'm always told that I misinterpreted it. I've never gotten it right, ever. <laughs> it's always a love letter. I guess somehow it went right over my head. So when I, I can't use the word, and I won't, I'm not even going to use an abbreviation. <laughs> uh, it's a very obscene word, the so-called Catholic Church. I guess I missed the point on that, too. Look, when you lie about my religion and you can't substantiate it, and as I say, I've annotated this. I have the proof that I'm correct on everything. I didn't make this stuff up. And you're going to now come back and say that she's the great hero. She says, I forgive the nuns. No, honey, you need to forgive the nuns for lying about them and telling your malicious, obscene lies, along with Harvey Weinstein and the rest of them associated with this movie. Mm. Finally, Frontline aired a special last week, Bill, called The Secrets of the Vatican, which really went after Benedict XVI, particularly his policies regarding sexual abuse. Your take. Well, the game that is being played by the Catholic left and the secular left, there's really not that much difference between the two of them, quite frankly, mm -hmm. is that we got good pope, bad pope. Okay, the bad pope mm -hmm. is Benedict, and to some extent, John Paul II. We got to make uh, uh, the villain out of uh, Pope Benedict XVI, who did more, by the way, to deal with the question of sexual abuse of minors than any pope. 
And the, then they can sell, they're, they're in a position to elevate Francis. Now, I love Francis, too, but what they're doing is they're inflating him. This is part of the game. So we, he's going to come to the rescue, and he's going to do all these wonderful changes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a slam on Pope Benedict XVI. I will not be part of it. I love Benedict, and I love uh, Francis. But this is the game that is being played by the left. Mm. Uh, you've been embroiled recently in this controversy uh, about the St. Patrick's Day parade. You and the Catholic League march every year. There's been controversy. The mayor of New York, de Blasio, has said he's not going to march out of protest because uh, gays are not allowed to march in the parade. Now the New York City Council is joining him. Your response? Again, people are factually incorrect. This is not a matter of opinion. Gays have never been bought in over 200 years from marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. I have gone on the radio and personally invited homosexuals to march with the Catholic League, provided you be like everybody else, which seems to be a hard thing to do these days, and that is just simply blend in. Look, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, I know John Dunleavy, he's a friend of mine, he runs this, the parade committee. They have a rule which says it's about St. Patrick, not anything else. Pro-life people can march in the parade, just like gays. Pro-lifers cannot have their own banners, their own contingent, their own float. So according to the logic of these people, if the, if the St. Patrick's Day parade is anti-gay, it must be anti-life. Now, everybody knows this. There's nobody who's claiming victim status except for homosexuals. They're the ones who want to crash the parade. If I wanted to get into their gay pride parade with my own float, with big banners saying straight is great, they would have a right to feel uh, a put upon, and I wouldn't do that to them. You know, they just don't want to blend in like everybody else. And if people think that I'm exaggerating this, take a look at the pictures of the gays in the, in the parades in Queens and New York and Sunnyside and, and Woodside and in Dublin. They don't dress like normal people. They don't act like normal people. And when it comes to the gay pride parade, I have seen and have pictures of them going naked in the streets. I know where they want to go with this. And all I want is a day for St. Patrick. They don't believe in tolerance. They don't believe in diversity. We won in the Supreme Court of the United States. If they want to have their parade, fine. But they can't crash ours or lie about it. Very good. Thank you, Bill. Be sure to look for Bill Donahue's op-ed in the March 3rd edition, Monday, of the New York Times. And you can follow Bill Donahue and all of his work at the Catholic League at catholicleague.org. Their annual report is also out. When we return, my exclusive interview with best-selling author and master of suspense, Dean Koontz. And how safe are the generic drugs you're taking? Our report is coming up when the world over live continues. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. He's written more than 70 books, many of them New York Times bestsellers. He is one of the foremost authors of Suspense Working Today. His latest novel, Innocence, continues his emphasis on the supernatural and something more. It grew out of a short story he wrote in 2013 about a young man named Addison Goodhart, a misunderstood loner searching for hope. I sat down with him recently at his home in Southern California, and we talked about his writing process, how he stays inspired, and the ways his faith continues to shape and influence his work. Here's my exclusive interview with Dean Koontz. Dean, I have to tell you, uh, I just finished Innocence, and it is such an unbelievable read, so I want to spend a little time talking about it. At the center of this piece is this character, Addison. He is an outsider. He is a loner. Um, there are some qualities, I thought, that were similar to your uh, odd Thomas. Mm. Tell me, are you, why are you drawn to these outsiders, these sort of figures in the shadows? Uh, you know, I never thought of that as being part of what I do, or that I often go to outsider characters on the fringes of society. Mm. And then some critic wrote it in a review, and I suddenly stopped and thought, that's correct. Uh, and I've thought about it since, which is maybe not a good idea, because <laughs> let your subconscious do what yeah. it does. Uh, and I think it's probably because I grew up feeling like an outsider. Mm. I was in a 
very poor family. My yeah. father was a violent alcoholic who had 44 jobs in 34 years. Mm. And he wasn't the town drunk, but he was one of the town drunks. Mm. And so I always felt humiliated as a kid and mm. was very shy because of that. So I always thought, I think probably all the way through college, I felt like an outsider to things. Huh. So it's probably why I'm drawn to heroes who aren't big strong men of action right. or instead fry cooks in a desert diner or yeah. or somebody like Addison who is the ultimate outsider. Yeah, yeah, living on literally living underground. And <laughs> and there's something about th th that that I, I certainly arrested my attention. He experiences the world really through the written word, through mm -hmm. books rather than direct contact. Is there any connection between that character and Dean Koontz? That's probably exactly correct because when I was a child, the way to escape what I was living through, my mother was a great person, uh, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter if there's one sort of sociopathic yeah. personality in the house. And uh, so I escaped into books and I mm -hmm. went to the library. I, as early as 10, probably even probably eight or nine, I would go to the library and go through the children's book section. And I remember when I got to be 12, the librarian, I had read all the young adult fiction and oh everything. And so the, uh, the librarian said, you know, you're not allowed to go into the adult section until you're 16. Mm -hmm. But in your case, I'm going to let you go in there at 12. And of course, this was in a much more innocent time. So mm -hmm. there wasn't exactly anything yeah. horrifying in the adult yeah. section. Yeah. Uh, but books showed me not just escape, how to escape uh -huh. my circumstances, they showed me that there were other ways people lived. You know, mm. when you're a kid, you kind of tend to think that the way things are in your house when the doors close mm -hmm. is the way it is everywhere. And so books were the way I learned about the world. So in that sense, I have Addison. Yeah, same thing. there's a little bit of you in Addison. No, he was, he's such a beautifully drawn character. I mean, you are, your heart goes out for him instantly. He obviously has some sort of defect. Uh, he hides his face. People don't want to look at him. And in fact, they're drawn to rage when they see him. They, mm. And horrible things happen. So he sort of lives in the shadows. In some ways, there is a real lyrical tenderness here in this work, in between the lines almost. Um, I, I found it extremely moving, and there are obvious things we cannot talk about. Mm. You want to leave some mysteries intact and mm. let the readers enjoy the experience. What are you hearing about this, and why is this so different, do you think? You've even said that this is very different for you. Why? It's, um, there's times in your career when you make a leap that you, you don't know where it came from. It might have been the cumulative things you've been writing all these years and the, mm -hmm. the lessons you learn as you go. But it really sometimes just feels like you've been given an inspiration, you've been given a gift. Oh. And this book felt like a, a grace given to me. When I started to write it, I knew I wanted it to be very lyrical. We have such a beautiful language, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> there's so much you can do with it. And I knew that this story would be best told as, if it was very lyrical, if it read almost like poetry. Huh. Uh, and I didn't know if I could achieve that, but as soon as I heard Addison's voice, and since he tells the story, as soon as I heard his voice, it began almost to tell itself. Mm. I've never had anything write so smoothly uh, with so little effort on my part as this. Now, not to say it was easy. Yeah. It's never easy. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> I was, um, in this one, the language, more than ever, is as important as the plot. And uh, because it creates mood. And I don't know that I've ever created sustained mood as much as I have in this. And yeah. it's interesting because there are so many different characters in it. Even though he's narrating mm -hmm. it, there are, there's a, quite a cross-section of city life in it. And, uh, and nevertheless, as it kept going, I kept beginning every day, I go back and think, I read what I've written and I think, I'm not going to be able to sustain this. And the moment mm -hmm. you don't sustain it, the dream breaks. Yeah, you've lost the audience, and, mm -hmm. uh, but happily it's sustained all yeah. the way through. Where did you find that voice? That's, al that's always such a challenge when, mm -hmm. you're, when you're writing in first person in the voice of a character. Finding that voice can be awfully difficult. And this one just came to you? Mm -hmm. It's uh, what you want, what you definitely don't want is if you've done other first person narratives, mm -hmm. you don't want him sounding like Odd Thomas or 
like I wrote a book called Life Expectancy, oh, yeah. and that is a very different voice. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this case, I just almost started to hear Addison speaking to me. Hmm. And uh, he's, he was such a charming character. This book isn't full of uh, Odd Thomas kind of humor. It's a yeah. more sober It is, story. yeah. I was actually, look, I, I thought, oh, well, I know there's going to be some <laughs> real laughs along the way. And they're really, it, it's sort of a very suspenseful, heartfelt, um, really, it's, a, it's people searching for love and mm -hmm. uh, experiencing loss and rebirth. I mean, it really is a, you, you deal with themes here in a way that I don't think you've ever dealt with them before. Are, do you have a sense of that? I think so, but it's a it's a very difficult thing it, to to describe. Yeah. Uh, why do I know I've dealt with themes here in a different way and perhaps a deeper way than mm -hmm. before? Yes. Can I explain what I mean by that? Almost certainly no. Mm. Uh, it's just that as it began to unfold, and there is Addison to give the viewer a little idea. Sure. Addison, on the night he is born, is born in a remote house high on a mountain. Uh, only his mother and he and the midwife and her daughter. And the moment he's born, the daughter runs from the room in terror and the midwife tries to smother him with the birthing blanket. And mm -hmm. after that, he never sees anyone but his mother for the next eight years. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the eight years, his mother says, I can't stand to look at you anymore and turns him out. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was something so sad but real about that. I mean, we're living in a time where people as horrifying as it is, you know, police find babies left in dumpsters. Yeah. And, and so it, it ties to a real world feeling here. And you know there's something mm -hmm. badly wrong with Addison, but you don't know what it is. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I just identified with his voice so strongly. I guess we go back to identify with outsiders. Yeah. And he is probably the ultimate outsider I've ever written about. He, he really is, he really mm -hmm. is. I wanna give people a little sense of the lyricism we're talking about. There's one point in the book, and you write, and this is Addison just describing a snowfall. And in it, he really captures, and you capture, I think, uh, one of the themes of this work. He says, through the stillness, snow fell, not in skeins, but in infinitely layered arabesques, laying boas on the limbs of leafless trees, ermine collars on the tops of walls, a grace of softness in a hard world. Is that what this work represents for you? <clears throat> yes, in fact, it does. The, the title, Innocence, is... Um, I had another title for a very short period of time, and, and it, I, I came to my senses. Uh, <clears throat> and it was... Uh, uh, I knew from the beginning this book is about innocence, and it's a celebration of innocence. Uh, it, Addison is completely innocent, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I will say no more, but yeah. he's, he's a very sweet character, and uh, I, we're living in a time where we've lost our innocence as a society, mm. as a culture, and I think it's one of the bit, big things that's wrong. You know, when I was a child, I could get on a bicycle and just ride all over town. I could be gone all day. Nobody would ever think that anything could happen to me. Mm -hmm. uh, now parents are afraid to let their children play in the front yard. Right. Um, and our culture has just lost its innocence. And uh, I, I wonder how I would grow up if I was young now and yeah. growing up in this culture. And I wanted to write a book that celebrates characters who are innocent, mm. who are not hipsters or, you know, uh -huh. they're, they're, they are cool, but they aren't cool by the definition of what's cool these days. Yeah, well, Gwyneth, the girl <clears throat> character in here, the, the female lead, she's certainly a goth girl. She's, a, she's sort of a hipster. Gwyneth has a, uh, both of them have problems. Addison, mm -hmm. when people see him, his eyes, his face, even his hands, mm -hmm. a, a glimpse of him, they are sometimes driven to want to kill him. And, mm -hmm. and they infuri infuriated and terrified at the same time. Gwyneth is... A, uh, she has social phobia. Uh, mm. She can't bear to be touched around mm. people. And when he meets her and says, well, I can't allow you to look at me and you can't allow me to touch you, mm. we're hostage to our eccentricities. We're made for each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so in her way, yeah, she dresses in all this goth, so people, it will turn people away from her. her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and it's her disguise in a way, mm. and her way of putting distance between herself and me. There's a, there's a line that, that leapt out at me, um, <laughs> and it's late in the book. Addison says this. There are things you hope for but never expect to receive because there is no luck and never was, but also because there are things of such great value that not all the good you could do in an entire lifetime would be mm. enough to make you worthy of them. If one of your hopes is fulfilled, if that precious thing ever comes to you, it comes to you as a grace. And every day of your life thereafter, you need to give thanks for the gift. The girl I met in lamplight near Charles Dickens, she was my grace, all I wanted or would ever want. Mm. There is a sort of um, wrestling here with an innocent love, a yearning to mm -hmm. be loved and to love. That's sort of at the center of this piece. Mm -hmm. um, was that an intention when you started, or did that fall out in the writing? I, I always knew there was going to be at the center of this, though it's suspenseful and everything else. Yeah. It's, at its heart, it's about love. Mm -hmm. And it's about love between a man and a woman, but it's also about love of, of God and God loving us. Mm -hmm. And it's about all kinds of love, really, within, within the story. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I've been married to my wife 47 years, mm -hmm. and I often think I saw her standing at a street corner. Uh -huh. uh, we had gone to the same high school, uh, but there were so many students in it. It was the central high school for the entire county. Mm -hmm. And I had never seen her in the halls, and I was a senior and she was uh -huh. a junior. And I was in a car riding with a friend of mine, his family had an extra car, and uh -huh. uh, we stopped, and she was standing at a street corner, waiting, crossing to go, about to cross to go to work. And I said to him, who is that? And he said, oh, you don't want anything to do with her. And I said, why not? She, oh, she's just the shoemaker's daughter. And I thought, well, I'm just town drunk's son. <laughs> at least her dad works. Yeah, this could be a step up. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so I was so taken with her that uh, I found out who she was then, and she had always been the president of her class every year. Hmm. And so I found out where her homeroom was, and I endeavored to cross her path several times. Mm. And, uh, uh, and I often think if I hadn't been at that street corner at that moment, hmm. I had been in school with her for years and never seen her. Yeah. I would probably have gotten through the rest of my senior year without ever seeing her. And uh -huh we would never have been married. So there are moments you know are part of your destiny, I think, mm. and which I think is a grace. That's a mm -hmm. great grace because I can't imagine ever having been married to anyone else. Huh. So and, and, that, that's and, sort of, I guess, where I got yeah, Addison and You Glenn feel that in the book. You feel yeah. it. It's deeply felt and rendered in you, and, and the reader certainly experiences it. There is also random evil throughout this book, mm -hmm. and it moves that with an alarming sort of randomness and, and terror. Um, is that part of your conception and understanding of evil in the world, that it doesn't pick one or two targets but lashes out in many directions and comes unpredictably? It's, evil is unpredictable. Uh, it's because it comes out of chaotic thinking, mm -hmm. uh, and we know who the father of chaos is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, in, in our world, we see random evil of the most outrageous kind all the time. It's, uh, you know, I hardly ever watch the evening news anymore because there's too much on it I don't want to let into my head. Tell me all about it. <laughs> <laughs> i got to cover this stuff. So it's... Uh, That's why I read your books, to escape from it. Well, in a book, in fiction, which is why I always write and, and love to write, is mm -hmm. you can manage the world. Yep. You can take the world that sometimes seems to make no sense, and you can say, which this book does in particular, mm -hmm. it can say it makes perfect sense if you're willing to see the world as it truly is mm -hmm. in all its mystery and depth, and mm -hmm. then things begin to make more sense to you. Yeah. Um, and people will say to me, um, not so far in this book, but they, I'm sure I will hear it, well, uh, is this going to say there's good and evil? Because I, you know, I don't really believe there is. I think there's Mm -hmm. levels of gray. Even in bad people, there's a little goodness, and even mm -hmm. in good people, there's badness. Yeah, sure. Yes, but there is evil, and it's, mm -hmm. it's manifest, and you see it every day. And mm -hmm. if you don't recognize it, if you're going to live your life thinking evil isn't real, you're defenseless, mm -hmm. because it is real. You have long, in the course of your work, championed and pointed out the great value in the disabled, in those with disabilities. There is a girl at the center of this book who is in a coma-like state. Um, 
And one gets the feeling from some of the characters that mm. she should have been disposed of a long time ago. Is that, how, how calculated is that on your part, that I'm going to put someone in this book who has disabilities because I want to show the value of their life? Well, I, I will say I didn't start knowing that character mm -hmm. was going to be there, but there came a moment in the story where I knew there had to be something, these two characters together, there had to be someone they needed to save. Uh -huh. at the penultimate moment of the story. Mm -hmm. And because my wife and I have for a long time worked with charities for people with severe disabilities, uh, I've met many, many of them, uh, hundreds, and I've, I've, they're inspiring people because I, I, they don't complain about their lives, they just want to live as fully as they can. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have become aware of the utilitarian bioethics, the, Peter Singers of the world who believe that disabled people might not necessarily get antibiotics because they don't contribute to the happiness of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the arguments they make. They, they add to the misery of the world. So yeah. it's a moral decision to let them die uh, so that the world will be a happier place. Mm -hmm. I think that's somebody who has something seriously wrong with them to mm -hmm. think that way. Because what I've gotten out of people I've met, children who the most heartbreaking are children with severe disabilities, but they're exuberant, the ones I've met, and I've met many of them. Uh, we've known little girls in wheelchairs who handle them like skateboards, yeah. and they're, they're yeah. just aggressive and just full of Incredible. life. And those people don't think their quality of life isn't worth living. They think quality of life, they'd like to have the higher quality of life, sure. but they're happy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to have a character in this that not only is it a good thing that they did take care of her in this story because eventually I won't, don't want to give away a plot turn, yeah, yeah. but she turns out to be of great value. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so it, at some point I knew I was going to have somebody to save and that's when it came to me, mm -hmm. what is this a book about? You know, it's, you have all kinds of themes when you're working on a book. Sure. But I th at that time I had to reconcile myself to what is the main theme of that, this mm -hmm. book, and it's about love and all its forms. You have said that this book represents an evolution for you. And we talked a little earlier about what you think that, that, that evolution is. How do you think it will change your forthcoming work and the way you approach it? Uh, I've already written a book since writing this one, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the change continued. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the lyricism of the writing changed, uh, but it's a different first-person narrative. Mm -hmm. I mean, the lyricism has stayed the same, but, but it's in a different voice this huh. time. And uh, it's, I, I, I won't say how much it's, what it's about exactly, it's a novel called Secret Forest, but okay. it ha one of its central themes is our relationship with nature. Hmm. What, is, what is a moral and intelligent relationship with nature, mm -hmm. and what is a skewed and Disordered. Disordered mm -hmm. relationship with nature. And you, you would immediately think, oh, well, environmentalists are always right. No, that's not necessarily the case. Mm. It's, you know, it, it's, it became fascinating to me. It's, huh. it's complex in the way that this is in, on different themes. But huh. uh, it's about a woman who starts developing a different relationship with nature. I'll only say that okay. much more about her. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> but it takes us into a place where separates nature from God. God created nature, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't worship nature. Mm -hmm. Nature is a great gift. Uh, the whole world is a great gift. Even Addison says that sure. in his book. But yeah. uh, there, are, there are right ways and wrong ways to think about nature, and some of them can be just deadly to your spiritual and mm. your physical health. Mm -hmm. And uh, this book plays with a lot of that. So. I think this is permanently, and then I've, hmm. I'm working on a book that's from the point of view of a 57-year-old black piano player who's telling you about something that happened to him when he was 10 to 14. Wow. And it's different from these books, but because it's being told like oral history, mm -hmm. and I've never done a book like that either. So hmm. all of a sudden, at my age, you're supposed to be going, oh, I might retire, and I'm just you're just getting started. I'm very exhilarated every day I go into the office. So. A number of people I've spoken to, um, librarians who've read the book, who really read, mm -hmm. um, some rabid Dean Koontz fans, and my own perception is that the 
corner you have turned here, there's, a, there's almost a Flannery O'Connor feel when we read this book because it is probing into the heart of what afflicts so much of the culture and so many of us. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a, at once a, a great story being told, but there's almost the philosopher whispering in your ear as you move through it. Are you aware of that? Uh, to the extent that I, I've long had, there's some people don't like that. I never get on a soapbox in a novel. No, no, you don't. But Nor I, do you hear. No, no. But, but I like characters who think about things. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I like characters. Odd Thomas is thinking about things at all times, and he tells mm -hmm. you what he thinks of yeah. all kinds of things yeah. in the world. And in Innocence, I knew that this character has had a lot of time to think about things. Mm -hmm. He's lived in secret under the city in storm drains and subway tunnels mm -hmm. and all of that, and he can't show himself in public. And now at 26, you know, he's coming out because he sort of meets this girl in the library late at night. Mm -hmm. And he's had a lot of time to think about life and to read about it. And even though he hasn't interacted with people a lot, there's a great wisdom in him. Mm -hmm. And later in the book, we'll, we'll understand why there yeah. is a great yeah. wisdom in it, sure. but it comes as a surprise. And he's, uh, so I'm aware of that. And you all, I just, I want to know what I think about the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And a character isn't always the author, um, mm -hmm. but because you have to be true to the character. Uh, but it helps me to write a character who is observant and who has a little bit of a philosopher in himself because mm -hmm. it helps me to think things through mm -hmm. in my own life. And th this book, I'm not saying it's like therapy, but it's, it's like a confessional in a way. It's it like really a little, is. Yeah, in some ways it's like a, 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 a retreat as a dream. Oh, it has I like that, that yeah. feel to it. It's and and you said earlier you don't get on a soapbox. You don't. These you're riding along with these characters. You're immersed in their story. There are moments that are absolutely terrifying. Uh, the evil is palpable around these characters. So the world is sort of coming in on them. And yet, when you blow by these scenes on the other side of them, you go, "Wait a minute!" And you sort of look back and go, "Wow!" You know, it it, it makes you rethink or you see. Mm situations or events in the culture in a whole, or in your own life in an entirely different way. It is a Catholic sensibility that seems to me is becoming more pronounced mm -hmm. beneath the work, mm -hmm. not on the surface of it. Are mm -hmm. you conscious of that? Yeah, I would say that uh, there's a character of a homeless man in it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a main character, but he's a strong secondary mm -hmm. character. And uh, he has a surprising role to play, but mm -hmm there's a character in the book who basically has saved him in a way. And mm -hmm. there is within this book the, the, the whole very Catholic idea that we're, we're all in, the, in Christ together, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the mystical body of Christ. And that these mm -hmm. characters, that, that is true, they're all on a journey together. Right. And, uh, and so they're, they have responsibilities to one another. Mm -hmm. And the bad guys, of course, don't, don't see they have any responsibility, yeah. but, uh, but our leads do. And yeah. uh, that really consciously was something I was working on in this mm -hmm. book. Well, you've accomplished it. It is a beautiful book, Innocence, and uh, I look forward to the next one. Well, I hope I'm around to have quite a few more. Well, I think you'll be around <laughs> for quite a few. The, the way you write with the speed at which you write, it's, it's amazing to me. I, I, I want to end with this. Last time I was here, I was so in awe of your routine. Every day, you walk down this hall, you go into your office, and you basically sequester yourself away there for the day. Mm -hmm. This is your life mm -hmm. here. Do you ever feel like a hermit? Like you're away from, I mean, you're, in some ways you're like the monks down here at the bottom of the hill. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, your, your life is sort of spent, focused, poured out on this work, and you really don't spend much time out of these walls. Uh, I used to spend more time out, but mm -hmm. uh, one of the Norbertine monks that we're friends with has told me this house is kind of like a monastery, and I kind of lead a monastic life. But mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> it's partly because when you're creating, it's much, much better to spend long hours at it, mm -hmm. because the fictional world begins to be more real to you. Yeah. And 
writers who say, I only work three hours a day, I can't even imagine that because mm -hmm. I, I would, it would be too disconnected to me. Mm -hmm. And I was able with our other Golden Ray, first Golden Ray to your very head, I could write with her in my room with me because huh. she was not too needy. But the oh. new Golden Retriever, I can't write with her in the room. She wants her head in my lap all the time. And uh, so it's there I am alone in the room. Jerda's mm -hmm. office is right next door, and we're free to come in and out of each other's office. But mm -hmm. you know, but it's there's something beautiful about solitude, too. I mean, I, I love human beings. I love people. Sure, uh, sure. And But there, solitude is, there's a lot to be said for it, because mm -hmm. uh, it's time to think. It's time to put away all the busyness of the world and focus on what you think is more important. And if you're writing fiction, you should believe that even if you're writing fiction that's meant to find a large audience, you should still believe that you're writing about things that are important or important to you, and, or otherwise, what's the point of doing it? Yeah. So it allows you to have a lot of solitude to think about things in your own life, and they end up sort of flowing right out onto the page. Yeah. And uh, uh, I can't imagine doing it any other way. You can follow all things Kuntzian by following his website at deankuntz.com. Now to our final segment, just how safe is our generic drug supply? And what standards does the government use to evaluate the safety of those drugs? This story is a shocker and one everyone deserves to hear, particularly those who rely on life-saving generic drugs. Recent reports suggest that there are major lapses. India supplies 40 percent of the generic and over-the-counter drugs to the United States. According to the World Health Organization, one in five drugs manufactured in India are fakes. And we haven't even begun to speak about China. Here to give us a glimpse into what the government is doing or not doing to protect all of us is research fellow at the Manhattan Institute's Center for Medical Progress FDA watcher Yevgeny Feynman. Yevgeny, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. So how concerned should we be about these stories, and we see many of them now, that uh, there are lapses in these Indian plants where so many of the drugs that come to the United States and are exported around the world originate? You know, it's, it's very scary. We had a huge scandal with Red Baxi Pharmaceuticals. It was a generic uh, drug maker in India, and it turned out that a ton of their drugs, most of their drugs, uh, that they were shipping to uh, African countries, to the U.S., were completely fake. Uh, they manufactured generic Lipitor, right. and it turned out that it was adulterated uh, with glass shards. The FDA fined them $500 million. That's the largest right. fine ever placed on a generic manufacturer. Um, the FDA is definitely stepping up their game, but we're not out of the woods yet. Yeah, they're now inspecting 160 of the plants. Um, they're claiming progress. I want to share with you and the viewers, this is Dinesh Thangkur. He was the whistleblower, a former Rambaxi executive. That's the company that was fined $500 million. He speaks here about the data needed to prove the effectiveness of these generic drugs made at their Indian plant. Listen. The data is important because the FDA or other agencies globally look at that information to give you marketing authorization to sell that drug. That it works, that it's safe. That's right. We start getting into the files, and lo and behold, we find that none of that exists in the first place. What did that mean? It means that we've gotten approvals from the FDA to uh, sell drugs that were based on no data or data that was fraudulent. How common do you think this is? <laughs> you know, India's regulatory apparatus for pharmaceuticals is mm -hmm. very, very small. It's very young. India's pharmaceutical industry is very young in general. They don't have the expertise that the FDA has. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is a much bigger problem. And it's good that the FDA is finally recognizing that it's a problem. Um, they've recently decided to devote $20 million through 2017 to start testing all sorts of drugs, including generic drugs, not just at the time of application, but randomly. They're going to request um, batches from, from companies at random times to make sure yeah. that the drugs are what they say they are. But Yevgeny, the Indians are not pushing back. India is saying, wait a minute, the FDA polices the United States, not here. And they're just trying to control the flow of these cheaper generics into the market. How credible is that? And what about China? 
you know, so obviously the, the FDA only polices the United States, and that's exactly why the FDA needs to be able to inspect facilities in India if they want to export into the United States. Mm -hmm. This is one of those few industries where poor quality can lead to people dying. It can lead to mm -hmm. very measurable harm. So the argument that the FDA is trying to police India isn't a very credible response. Yeah. Now, China. They, they've been a little reticent about uh, inspections, but they've done so in a very clever way. Uh -huh. What they've done is they haven't issued visas to new, new FDA inspectors that are supposed mm -hmm. to come into the country. That's probably uh, more, more of them holding out, trying to uh, flex their muscles a little bit mm -hmm. against the United States than an indication of the quality of drugs that would be manufactured in China. But this is a major concern. I mean, vital components to so many of the steroids and the antibiotics that are exclusively made in China we rely on. Without those components, we uh, can't make these drugs or, or bring them into the marketplace. Uh, but to have no inspections in China, and from what I'm reading, they won't allow inspections of their, their uh, plants. Right, so we, we do have uh, some inspections. A, a GAO report uh, that was released in uh, 2008 actually looked at inspections uh, by country from 2002 mm -hmm. to 2007. China w was, was on there. We don't do as many inspections as we should, mm -hmm. absolutely. And that really has to do with China's constant uh, competition with the U.S. Uh, they are the, pretty much the world's second largest economy. They're mm -hmm. the, the world's largest country. So they always feel a need to flex their muscles against the U.S. But in general, China has a more developed pharmaceutical industry than India does. They have a better class of uh, biological engineers, of ch chemists that really are dedicated to their craft. Whereas in India, because this, indus this, this industry is so young and they're trying to protect mm -hmm. their cost advantage um, as early as possible, we're seeing much more quality issues than what we're seeing in China, even with a few inspections that we have done in China. Evgeny, we only have a minute. How concerning is all of this, given that the Affordable Care Act is routing so many patients in the United States toward generic drugs and away from the marquee brand brands? <laughs> you know, we, we've, we've been using uh, generics um, m much more than brands for a while now. So about 84% of prescriptions that are prescribed in the U.S. are for generics. Now, that, that's going to increase even more with, with Obamacare, with the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And it is something we should be concerned about. That's why I'm not really worried about the FDA stepping up its game here. This is the one time where I'd say that the FDA should pursue more heavy-handed regulation to make sure that a Ranbaxy case never happens again. And do you see that happening? Happening? Or is this too slow, this progress? I mean, it seems they're late to the game of policing these uh, plants or inspecting them <laughs> with any, you know, with any uh, measurable imprint. Sure. They're, they're definitely a little bit late to the game, and part of it has to do with the authority. Uh, we will need an act of Congress to give the FDA more discretion in what they demand from companies, how they inspect facilities. Right now, it's very difficult for the FDA to ban uh, imports from a company. Um, unless they meet particular requirements, they can only ban facilities. So Congress needs to step up their game also, and I am hopeful that in the coming years, Congress is going to do that. Very good. Yevgeny Feynman, thank you so much for being with us, and we will continue to watch this story. It's very important. That is all the time Thanks we for have me. for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are on my website, and I post the entire show there each week. And if you sign up for my free e-blast, I'll send you exclusive content and the latest news. Go to the center of the website page at RaymondArroyo.com. You can also catch the show 24-7 on EWTN's YouTube channel. Be sure to tune in next week. Elaine Bennett will join us to talk about her new book, Daughters in Danger, Helping Our Girls Thrive in Today's Culture. Really important. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. Happy Mardi Gras. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. We'll see you next time. Bye.